Hello all, welcome back to Climate Dynamics. Today we're going to be talking about energy and the Earth system. The reference for this material is Marshall and Plum, Chapter 2. In this section, we're going to learn the definitions for temperature, conduction, convection, radiation, energy balance, black body, solar constant, insulation, albedo, planetary albedo, emission temperature, greenhouse effect, greenhouse gases, climate sensitivity, carbon dioxide sensitivity, and positive and negative climate feedbacks. The questions we're aiming to answer in this section are, why is energy balance a good approximation for the Earth system? How does insulation change as a function of latitude and season? How is insulation connected with local climatology? Why is the top of the atmosphere insulation different from surface insulation? What are the different pathways for radiation that reaches the Earth? And what simple models can be used to approximate radiative exchange? Fi finally, why is climate sensitivity hard to estimate? All right, so let's go back to basics and start at kind of a very fundamental level. This might remind you of basically introductory physics. What we refer to as temperature in the atmosphere is a macroscopic property of a particular parcel or fluid object um, that is actually a measure of kind of the average amount of kinetic energy that is present within that object. Although a air parcel may appear to be stationary, such as a balloon floating in air, there is a lot of activity going on within the balloon. The molecules of air within that balloon are bouncing around. In cold air, the typical molecule is moving relatively slowly, whereas in hot air, that those molecules are moving fairly rapidly. This connects rather nicely with the notion of, for instance, elastic collisions. Cold air tends to not exert a lot of pressure on its surroundings because individual molecules are not carrying a lot of energy. They're not moving particularly fast, so they tend to exert significantly less pressure on the external surface of the balloon, as opposed to hot air, where the individual molecules are moving fairly rapidly. Hence, any individual collision from a particular molecule will tend to exert more pressure. This kind of individual molecular view of temperature um, is a handy way to think about and how temperature connects naturally with density and pressure. And consequently, this will frame our discussion of the ideal gas law, which is a uh, great approximation for typical fluids, such as air, which again relates pressure, density, and temperature. So how can heat be transferred? Let's say you've got a chunk of relatively hot air with individual molecules moving fairly rapidly, and you got a chunk of cold air immediately adjacent to it. How can we transfer heat from that hot air parcel to the cold air parcel? Well, the first way that we can do that is through conduction. Uh, conduction is basically heat transfer due to contact. If you take a hot object and you put it next to a cold object, that the molecules from the hot object will collide with the molecules from the cold object, thus transferring kinetic energy. What you will find then is that the average kinetic energy of the molecules will generally stay the same, but individual molecules will tend to become less variable. That is, you will have the hotter molecules slowing down as they collide with the colder molecules and the colder molecules speeding up. This is a way in which the temperature then tries to regulate, tries to average itself out between the two objects. The second way in which heat can be transferred is via convection. This is heat transfer due to movement. So let's say, for instance, we have a fairly cold room, and we take a balloon full of warm air and release that warm air into the room. This then results in basically the average air temperature of the room increasing. Basically, you've introduced warm air into the room, so the average temperature of the room must increase. The convective process is very common in the atmosphere, and this is, for instance, associated with rising bubbles of warm air. If you have a bubble of warm air near the surface, then it rises up through the atmosphere. As it does, though, it's taking some of that energy with it and carrying that energy higher up into the atmosphere. So this is heat transfer due to movement. The third way that heat can be transferred is via radiation, and this is going to be perhaps the most important mechanism for the transfer of heat within the Earth's system. This is heat transfer due to photons. Basically, whenever you have 
a molecule um, that's vibrating because it has, of course, a temperature associated with it. Because of um, just natural laws of the natural laws of physics, you can have the emission of a photon from these individual molecules. So these are small bundles of effectively radiated energy, little photon particles that shoot out, uh, and that carries with it heat. The object emitting the photon loses a bit of energy in the process, hence reducing its overall temperature, but the photon then carries with it momentum. That momentum if can then carry across space. It doesn't need a medium like, conve like convection or conduction does in order to transfer the heat, but instead that photon will travel through space and it can then impart its momentum when it collides with a target. So when the photon hits another molecule, kinetic energy is then transferred to that molecule, thus speeding it up. So perhaps um, the most common example of this would be emission of photons from the sun. You have photons that travel from the sun through space, and they hit the earth, hence imparting energy from the sun to the earth. All right, so this is very closely connected with this notion of... Um, conservation of energy and global energy balance. Now, conservation of energy is, a, again, a very fundamental rule of nature. It is this notion that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Now, we're not dealing with any sort of relativistic scenarios, so we don't have to worry about uh, conservation of mass energy or transfer of energy into mass or anything like that. For all, every, for the purposes that we're interested in, in this class, we simply can refer to con conservation of energy, which we can effectively state as the change of energy in an open system must be equal to the energy received by that system minus the energy emitted. So if a system is in a state of energy balance, that is, it is not changing in terms of total energy content, then this must imply that the left-hand side of this equation is equal to zero, and we can then rearrange the equation to read energy received equals energy emitted. So energy balance then is simply this notion, energy received balances perfectly with energy emitted. Um, now we do know other rules from physics that govern, for instance, energy emission. Uh, a very common be referred to rule in this context would be like the Stefan-Boltzmann law. The Stefan-Boltzmann law is this very con concise discovery that the amount of energy typically emitted from an object is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature of that object. Thus, the more energy an object has, thus the more energy it will radiate. So, if you have a very hot object, it tends to radiate more energy. If you have a cold object, it tends to radiate less energy. So if we then take that back to this notion that the change of energy is equal to energy received minus energy emitted, if it is the case that the system is unbalanced, that is, the amount of energy is changing, the system will nonetheless try to equilibrate towards a state of energy balance. It'll try to move towards a state where energy received is equal to energy emitted. That is, if the system tends to be emitting more energy than it is receiving, it will cool in the process. That'll, that is, it'll be losing energy, and as it loses energy, it is emitting less energy overall. It will continue to emit less energy until it reaches that balance where energy emitted equals energy received and the change of energy of the system is equal to zero, and it will continue to emit at a constant rate equal to that energy received. Analogously, if the system is not emitting enough energy, that is if the energy received is greater than the energy emitted, then it will warm, it will gain energy through this notion of conservation of energy, and consequently it will emit more and more and more energy until energy received equals energy emitted. Since we know that the Earth has had a very long time in order to equilibrate its temperature and the amount of energy received by the Earth does not change significantly on time scales of millions of years, note that there are small variations in solar input, for instance, and there has been a slight increase over millions of years in the amount of energy output from the Sun, but for the types of time scales that we're interested in in this class, effectively the amount of energy received is constant. 
With these two axioms in hand, it's kind of a natural consequence that the Earth system is to a close approximation in a state of energy balance. That is, we can assume for the purposes of this class, that energy received by the Earth is approximately equal to the energy emitted by the Earth. Now, some of you may think that it's a bit strange that the Earth itself is emitting energy, but in fact, it is emitting energy in the infrared spectrum, which we cannot directly observe, but it is basically heat energy, what you might have heard of previously as heat energy. The Earth is relatively cool, so it radiates primarily in this long wavelength part of the spectrum. Whereas energy from the Sun is peaked instead in the visible part of the spectrum, where it's very apparent that actually we're receiving energy from the Sun. Nonetheless, the amount of energy received planet-wide does need to satisfy this relationship. So even though the emission is occurring in a different part of the spectrum than the reception of energy, the balance of total energy must hold. This is actually a very important point with regards to what type of energy we receive and what type of energy we emit. The fact that we emit terrestrial radiation in the long wavelength part of the spectrum is going to be important down the road when we assess how the atmosphere is behaving in light of energy received and emitted. So keep this in mind. Now note that energy balance is not actually affected by human activities. So regardless of how much greenhouse gases we pump into the atmosphere, under global warming, in equilibrium, the amount of energy emitted must equal the amount of energy received. That is, our human activities are not changing how much energy is being received by the planet, and so the amount of emission must also equal that amount received. What greenhouse gas emissions do instead is it changes the distribution of energy in the Earth's atmosphere. That will be key again for later on. All right, here's a little graphical depiction in order to show what is happening. The sun is emitting at an approximate temperature of about 6,000 degrees Kelvin. So this is approximately the temperature of the photosphere of the sun. That is the part of the sun that we see. And it is sending out photons um, through space that are radiating all around it, basically in a full sphere around it. Uh, and part of those photons if they are lucky, will eventually end up impacting on the Earth. And so if you calculate the total amount of energy from those photons received by the Earth, you will find that that balances exactly with the Earth's emission temperature of 255 degrees Kelvin. 255 Kelvin is a special number. Um, it's a special temperature, and basically it's the temperature needed for the planet Earth in order for the amount of energy emitted by the planet to perfectly balance the amount of energy received from the Sun. So, to emphasize, to maintain global energy balance, the Earth must radiate energy at the same rate that it receives it from the Sun. Now, something in my, to keep in mind here is that the Earth's surface temperature is not 255 Kelvin. In fact, this Earth's surface temperature is about 288 degrees Kelvin, or about 15 degrees Celsius. Uh, so this is quite a bit warmer than the emission temperature, and this does suggest that the energy coming from the Earth is not radiating directly from the surface, but is probably coming from slightly higher up in order to, for it to have this emission temperature. All right, so let's review what it means um, for us to have this relationship between temperature and wavelength of radiation. So the first definition we need to know is the definition of a black body, and this is an idealized physical body that absorbs all incident electromagnetic radiation, and it's in thermal equilibrium, so it's at approximately constant temperature, and emits black body radiation in accordance with Planck's law. Now Planck's law is actually depicted here, it's basically a probability density function uh, for the energy contained within photons emitted from that object. Notably, the energy emitted by an object at a constant temperature, it, all of the photons are not emitted at exactly the same wavelength, but instead they're emitted over a range of possible wavelengths. So for emission from the sun, for instance, what we see is that the peak of that probability density function tends to occur around the visible spectrum. So although quite a bit of the solar radiation um, 
comes from the visible spectrum, there is nonetheless the wings of this distribution, which indicate that it has basically broad coverage over the whole electromagnetic spectrum, including the infrared and the ultraviolet, which we are, of course, not able to perceive directly. Notably, the hotter an object is, though, the more energy it will radiate at any given wavelength. So even though the peak tends to move towards shorter wavelengths, which are associated with higher energy photons, at any given wavelength, a 5,000 Kelvin object will tend to emit more than a 4,000 Kelvin object. And again, you can kind of see that from the depiction here in this diagram. Now, there are two things about black bodies you need to keep in mind. It's an ideal emitter, that is, it emits as much or more energy at every frequency wavelength than any other body at the same temperature, and it's a diffuse emitter. So the energy is emitted isotropically independent of direction. So again, this is a bit of a physics idealization, but it is nonetheless a useful one. Planck's law is given here. Um, I don't recommend actually memorizing this unless that's th your discipline. Um, but what we do know is that if we take Planck's law and we integrate this over all possible wavelengths, that is, if we consider the total contribution from all photons at all wavelengths, what we find is that the total amount of energy emitted in terms of watts per meter squared from a black body is actually proportional to the fourth power of temperature. Uh, and that constant of proportionality is known as the Stefan-Boltzmann constant, and its value is given on the bottom here. It's about 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 joules per second per meter squared per Kelvin to the fourth. Hence, multiplying that by temperature to the fourth power in Kelvin will give a joule per second per meter squared or a watt per meter squared. All right, so the key point from this illustration is that the Sun and the Earth can be approximately considered to be black bodies. So as I said, this is a useful approximation, particularly in climate science. Hence, the type of radiation emitted by these objects can be determined from their temperatures. All right, let's do a slight aside, a problem as an aside. So if the sun's photosphere can be found at a radius of approximately 700,000 kilometers from the core and has an average temperature of approximately 5,770 Kelvin, can you use this information to approximate the total amount of energy emitted from the sun? Well, in fact, all we have to do is rely on the Stefan Boltzmann law and our formula for spherical geometry in order to calculate the surface area of a sphere. I leave it to you in order to figure out how to do that calculation, um, but the basic result is we calculate that in total the Earth or the Sun emits about 3.87 times 10 to the 26 watts. So that's quite an impressive amount of energy overall, uh, and we're fortunate I think that we only receive a small fraction of that total. So let's try to calculate that fraction. We know that the Earth rotates around the Sun in uh, what is pretty close to the um, orbital plane of the solar system, um, but it's basically a small object in the celestial sphere, and in fact, we're from a distance, we're really only a, a small disk on that celestial sphere. So what we need to do then is calculate how much of that total solar emission is actually received at the Earth per meter squared. And so if we know that the total emission from the Sun is the value that was calculated on the previous slide, and we know how far away the Earth is from the Sun, we can then again use our formula for spherical geometry, calculate the surface area of that sphere with a radius equal to the Earth-Sun distance given here, and then divide the total solar emission by that radius of the Earth-Sun sphere. And so if you do that, you actually get that the solar constant is approximately equal to 1367 watts per meter squared, and the solar constant in this case being the rate at which solar energy is received by the Earth per unit area. So in terms of total incident radiation, if the Earth was a disk, um, sitting at the Earth-Sun distance, it would receive about 1367 watts per meter squared. Notably, this is also the maximum amount of solar energy one could potentially extract from the Sun. So if you put a solar panel orbiting, in, uh, orbiting the Earth, that 
was set at such a point, maybe a Lagrange point, so that it was always facing the sun, um, and it was always perpendicular to incident solar radiation, the maximum amount of energy that solar panel could collect is 1367 watts per meter squared. So what's the total power incident onto the Earth from the sun? Well, we have our solar constant, we have the radius of the Earth, so uh, in terms of in order to calculate then the total power instant, we simply need to take the Earth disk. Uh, again, keep in mind that this is um, that the disk is what is really experiencing the outgoing solar radiation. Uh, use circular geometry then in order to calculate the area of that disk and calculate the total amount of energy incident onto the Earth, and we get instant power of 1.74 times 10 to the 17 watts. Okay, so that's the total amount of energy received on the Earth at any given time from the Sun. Now note, uh, because of energy balance, this is also the total amount of power that the Earth must emit. That is, we have energy balance at the Earth, that is, energy received must equal energy emitted. So if this is the total amount of energy received by the Earth, then this must also be the total amount of power emitted by the Earth. All right, follow-up question. If the Earth had no atmosphere, what is the spatially average instantaneous power per unit received by the Earth? So we're going to take the total surface area of the Earth. We're going to approximate it as a sphere. Use, again, spherical geometry. So the surface area of the sphere is 4 pi r squared. The radius of the Earth is approximately 6,371 kilometers, and so calculating amount of power per unit area gives 341 watts per meter squared. So this is the average amount of energy received on a spot on the Earth's surface over basically its over a whole year or over a whole day, accounting for the fact that the Earth is actually not a flat disk, but is instead a sphere. Okay, now obviously we're not receiving 341 watts per meter squared at every point on the planet at every time. In fact, the fact that the Earth itself is curved means that there are going to be different places receiving different amounts of radiation at any given time. I mean, this is pretty obvious when you think that half of the planet always finds itself in darkness because it's simply not facing towards the sun. So the curvature of the Earth's surface means that the power due to incident solar radiation is not actually equal across the surface, and so we only get basically a maximum amount of radiation when we're directly underneath the sun. And the amount of solar radiation actually received at a given point is actually proportional to the cosine of the great circle distance between that point and the subsolar point. So the great circle distance, for those of you who aren't familiar, is basically the distance as traveled over the surface of the planet and typically measured in radians, for instance. So a great circle distance of pi over 2 radians would be 90 degrees, and that's the distance between the North Pole and any point on the equator. However, a great circle distance, of course, works between any two points along the Earth's surface, and so it tends to be very useful. Now, the cosine factor comes in basically because you have the curvature of the surface. So if you are standing at the North Pole and the sun's radiation is directly overhead at the equator, that means that photons from the sun are basically passing parallel to the ground at the North Pole. And so in effect, you've, you're receiving zero radiation actually on the ground. So you'll notice that at pi over 2, cosine of pi over 2 is actually equal to 0, and so that's where the total amount of radiation does go to 0. Now as you move closer and closer to the equator, you're going to find that you're receiving more and more energy. Or analogously, if you're moving closer and closer to that subsolar point, you're going to be receiving more and more energy per unit area. Now the amount of actual energy that you are receiving at any given time in terms of watts per meter squared is, by definition, the insulation on that particular location. So uh, more formally, the insulation is a measure of the amount of solar radiation energy received on a given surface area and recorded during a given time.
So some spots on the planet may be instantaneously recording a solar radiation of 1000 watts per meter squared, whereas others are receiving 200 watts per meter squared, and the backside of the planet is receiving 0 watts per meter squared. So the time period is also relevant here because that determines the averaging window of the total amount of insulation. So how do we calculate instantaneous insulation? So that's the amount of insulation being received right now, basically instantaneously at this very moment. As I said, that is proportional to the cosine of the great circle distance. And for those of you who are interested, the great circle arc length formula or the great cis circle distance formula is shown on this slide. You can calculate it very easily from the um, latitude of the subsolar point from the latitude at which you're making the measurement and from the hour angle which is basically a representation of when the sun has risen. We'll get into that in a little bit more detail in um, the coming slides. So the instantaneous insulation is going to be zero if the cosine of the great circle arc distance is less than zero. Basically, this means that the sun is below the horizon. Recall, as I said, if the subsolar point is at the equator and you're standing at the North Pole, the great circle distance is pi by two. So the, uh, the cosine of the great circle distance is zero. And so you're effectively receiving zero energy at that point, And the amount of energy that you do receive gets larger the closer you move to that subsolar point. Um, the Amount of radiation received, though, is also dependent on the radius of the Earth's orbit instantaneously. The Earth mostly has a circular orbit, but if you consider over long time periods or you consider the basically the in intra-annual variation in total amount of solar energy received, there are some variations that do occur because of changes in the radius of the Earth's orbit. So for sake of completeness, we're going to say... We're going to include that in our instantaneous insulation formula and say, um, well, the total amount of instantaneous insulation that we receive at any latitude and longitude is equal to the solar constant times the mean radius of the Earth's orbit squared divided by the current radius of the Earth's orbit squared times the cosine of the great circle distance between the subsolar point and your current observing point. So note that if the radius of the Earth's orbit it, at present is actually beyond the mean radius, then you tend to have less insulation. And if it's closer to the sun, you tend to have more insulation. So everything kind of makes sense. All right. The latitude of this subsolar point can actually be calculated in terms of the Earth's axial tilt and the polar angle of the Earth's orbit. So again, this adds some complexity to calculating this insulation value. Um, the polar angle of the Earth's orbit is basically where we are in the year. So at on March 21st at the spring equinox, we define the polar angle of the Earth's orbit to be zero. Then as the Earth moves around the sun from that point, we increase the angle uh, slowly. And so on the 21st of June, the polar angle of the Earth's orbit is 90 degrees. On the 23rd of September, on the fall equinox, it's 180 degrees. And at the 21st of December, the uh, during the winter solstice, the polar angle is 270 degrees. The axial tilt of the Earth is basically fixed at this point. Um, over geologic time scales, you do have to worry about wobbles in the axial tilt. Um, but for our purposes, we can just plug in an axial tilt of 23.4398 degrees. And this then gives you the latitude of the subsolar point at any given point in time uh, as the Earth moves its way around the sun. All right, so we want to take instantaneous insulation and we want to uh, calculate the daily average insulation received at that particular location. That is, we want to average out the diurnal cycle due to sunset and sunrise. All right, so if you take that formula for instantaneous insulation and you integrate it over all possible hour angles, that is, you integrate it over um, all hours from midnight to midnight, what you find is that the average daily insulation received is given by the formula shown in the box here. Uh, again, H0 denotes the hour angle when the sun rises at that particular location, and this can actually be calculated in terms of the uh, in terms of theta and delta, uh, where delta was on the previous slide. And for reference, the hour angle of sunrise then um, is shown 
basically as this linear function of what time of day it is at if the sun rises at 12 p.m., that also means that it sets at 12 p.m., and so the hour angle will be equal to zero. If you notice uh, from the formula in the middle here, if you plug in an hour angle of zero into that daily average insulation, you actually get zero daily average insulation because both terms within the square brackets are equal to zero. What this means is that you get no effective daily insulation because it's dark all the time. If your sunrise is at 180 degrees hour angle, then that basically means that the sun rises and sets at midnight or it's always light. And so you get the maximum amount of daily average insulation at that point. And then for anything in between, you can see kind of some reference for those hour angles here. And so with these formulas in hand, it enables you to calculate the total amount of insulation at any given point. So here's a plot of q bar day shown as a function of the polar angle of the Earth's orbit along the x-axis and the latitude at which the observation is taken along the y-axis here. So this starts with a polar angle of zero, which is March 21st, as I mentioned before, and then goes through the year. So the summer solstice in the northern hemisphere is June 21st, and you'll notice that's also when we have maximum insulation occurring at the North Pole. And on December 21st, you have maximum insulation occurring near the South Pole. The actual value of the maximum insulation ends up being somewhere around 560 watts per meter squared. So curiously, actually, this is the time and location where you can get the theoretical maximum amount of total solar radiation received per unit area at about 560 watts per meter squared. Now recall the solar constant was about um, 1360 watts per meter squared, so at on the Earth's surface, if you build a solar panel, you're going to be receiving a lot less energy, less than 50% of the amount of energy you would get compared to a satellite orbiter pointing at the sun. Um, along the equator, actually, you'll notice that the total amount of insulation is pretty constant, somewhere around um, 300 and. 60 to about 440 watts per meter squared, um, depending on how close to the equator you are. And in the mid latitudes, basically, we see typically um, at about 45 degrees north, uh, insulations at about 470 watts per meter squared on the summer solstice and dropping to about 200 watts per meter squared during the winter solstice. This insulation, that is amount of energy per unit area, is very important when it comes to determining the local climate. Near the equator where we have in, uh, solar radiation basically arriving perpendicular to the Earth's surface, you get the maximum amount of energy received per unit area um, basically over the whole extent of the year and the resulting surface type, the uh, resulting biome reflects this. We get This is where we get the rainforests of the world, where we have warm temperatures, consistent temperatures throughout the year, and because of um, convection induced by this surface warming, we end up with very rainy climates. Through the mid-latitudes, you of course have typical mid-latitudinal biomes or temperate biomes. So you get grasslands, temperate forests. Uh, this is with slightly less energy per unit area. So if you do the math on this at 45 degrees, you're going to see about 70% of the total amount of energy per unit area compared to the equator. And then if you go to the poles, uh, or closer to the poles and more of the tundra region, say 30 degrees from the pole or about 60 degrees north, you're going to have basically half as much energy per unit area as you do at the equator, and hence you have tundra or ice. So if we look at the annual mean insulation at the top of the Earth's atmosphere, what we get is the plot basically shown on the top here. You'll notice that the um, total watts per meter squared varies from again slightly over 400 watts per meter squared at the equator down to an annual mean insulation of about 160 watts per meter squared uh, at the north and south pole. 
So this is top of the atmosphere radiation. Now note that if you actually were to build a solar array at the surface, what you would instead see is a plot analogous to the one on the bottom. So significantly less radiation. So on the surface, even over the Sahara Desert, which is notoriously cloudless, we only get up to about 320 watts per meter squared compared to over uh, over at least 390, around 400 watts per meter squared at the top of the atmosphere. And if you go towards the poles, you actually get closer to 60 to 80 watts per meter squared at the surface. So what's the difference between these top and bottom figures? Why do you think that there is this massive difference in total insulation? And well, at the end of the day, it basically comes down to what's in between. What is happening to those photons between the point where they hit the top of the atmosphere and when they impact the surface? And in particular, they're going to be passing through the atmosphere in that time. And so let's take a look at what is happening to the photons between the top of the atmosphere and when they hit the surface. So incoming radiation from the sun comes in at the top of this figure and it passes through the atmosphere. The atmosphere is of course filled with gases and aerosols and other bits of things that have the potential in order to block out some of that incoming radiation. But in general there's five possible fates that this radiation will experience. It'll either be scattered or absorbed in the atmosphere and so we kind of combine those together uh, in in what is referred to as basically the extinction of total radiation. It can be reflected either in the atmosphere or reflected by the surface, or it can be absorbed by the surface. So this absorption at the surface will only occur uh, once it has already passed through the atmosphere, once it's not scattered, not absorbed, and not reflected by either the atmosphere or surface, then whatever fraction remains is what, is, what actually goes into warming of the surface. So what determines how much radiation is actually absorbed by the atmosphere? Now we're going to basically go through each of those five possible fates in order to uh, delve in a little bit more detail to understand what is happening to these photons. So there are different types of radiation determined by the wavelength of each photon, and the wavelength of the photon determines how it will interact with gases and particles in the atmosphere. This class is, of course, not a radiative transfer class, but um, there, one can of course teach an entire class entirely on the radiative transfer through the atmosphere. So I'll just give you a brief overview of kind of what's going on in that regard. All right, here's the electromagnetic spectrum. I referred to this earlier um, in the lecture, but basically it goes from gamma rays, which are our most highly energetic particles, or sorry, most highly energetic photons, to X-rays, to ultraviolet radiation, then visible radiation, uh, which we're all familiar with, then the near infrared, the far infrared, and then as you get to longer and longer, less energetic photons, you get microwaves, you get radio waves, and so, um, basically, we've been able to leverage this electromagnetic spectrum for a variety of scientific applications, um, and so it's really been a cornerstone for human development over the past hundred years. The solar emission um, tends to come from, or tends to peak at about 0.6 micrometers, which is right in the center of the visible spectrum. And terrestrial radiation, on the other hand, that is energy emitted by the Earth, tends to peak at about 15 micrometers, which is located in the far infrared part of the spectrum. So, again, the Wavelength of an incoming photon basically determines how it behaves as it passes through the atmosphere. Here is a plot showing um, an idealized 5525K energy profile taken from the Planck law um, with the red curve here. And on the right hand side of this diagram, we see three curves associated with various temperature profiles that are consistent with temperatures that you might find around the Earth. So um, Closer to the left-hand side here, the lighter purple, that's going to be about 310 degrees Kelvin. And the darker bluish line on the right-hand side is going to be about 210 Kelvin. Recall that the warmer the object, the more energetic the radiation, so the farther to the left it'll be in this diagram. Of the downwelling solar radiation, about only about 70 to 75 percent of that is transmitted through the atmosphere, so that means that um, 30 to, or sorry, 25 percent to 30 percent of it is either absorbed or reflected by the atmosphere. So the solid red that we see in this diagram here is actually how much radiation you would measure at the surface. Now you'll notice that it is 
significantly less than the idealized Planck law plot. And that difference, the white regions between the red line and the red region, are because of absorption and scattering and reflection in the Earth's atmosphere. The curve on the right, the difference between those two is basically if we have a perfect emitter that is represented by these blue and light purple lines here at the Earth's surface, how much energy would you observe in a satellite pointed down at the Earth? And you would find really that there's only a, a slight chunk of the infrared spectrum here located about between uh, 6 micrometers and about 11 micrometers where you have pretty much most of that outgoing thermal radiation from the Earth. So why is that? Well, this is all dependent essentially on the chemistry of the Earth's atmosphere and the type of gases that are present. If you look in the bottom six rows of this diagram, you'll actually see the relative absorption profiles associated with major constituents of the Earth's atmosphere. So water vapor is of course very common in the Earth's atmosphere and it tends to absorb a lot of radiation. In fact, it tends to absorb at almost 100% for wavelengths above about 11 micrometers through 70 micrometers. So pretty much all of that outgoing terrestrial radiation is being blocked from exiting the atmosphere because of the presence of water vapor in the atmosphere. But other gases are also contributing in regions where water vapor is allowing energy to escape. You'll notice carbon dioxide has peak absorption actually in some of the gaps of the water va vapor spectrum. And so it's blocking some of that outgoing terrestrial radiation from escaping by absorbing or scattering outgoing terrestrial radiation. You'll notice though that carbon dioxide pretty much does nothing to incoming solar radiation. So it behaves differently then for incoming solar radiation than it does for outgoing terrestrial radiation. And again, this is key um, for our understanding of how atmospheric chemistry impacts energy balance within the Earth's system and energy distribution within the Earth's system, and one of the reasons why carbon dioxide is what is referred to as a greenhouse gas. So what happens to most of the incoming solar radiation? Well, it turns out that much of that is killed off because of the two primary constituents of the Earth's atmosphere, nitrogen and oxygen. As well, ozone, which is produced through the interaction of solar radiation with oxygen, also tends to be an absorber of ultraviolet radiation just outside the visible spectrum. So that big gap that you see there in the ultraviolet spectrum between surface observed ultraviolet and solar top of the atmosphere ultraviolet, almost all of that is due to, again, oxygen and ozone in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, blocking that incoming solar radiation, absorbing the incoming solar radiation, um, and um, scattering that. Um, methane and nitrous oxide are also shown here, and we'll emphasize why that is later. Um, I'll give you a bit of a spoiler. It's because they're also greenhouse gases. And the final column here, this is Rayleigh scattering. This is basically scattering from molecules within the Earth's atmosphere, and this tends to be more potent at shorter wavelengths. Um, so it's another major contribution to the loss of solar radiation between top of atmosphere and when it hits the surface. So from this previous figure, what did we observe? Well, the atmosphere is almost completely transparent in the visible part of the spectrum. It is opaque in the ultraviolet spectrum, in particular due to oxygen and ozone absorption, and it has variable opacity across the infrared spectrum, being completely opaque at some wavelengths and transparent at others. And again, this is because of the chemical constituents of the Earth's atmosphere, in particular the greenhouse gases. The dominant constituent of the atmosphere, nitrogen gas, does not really play into absorption at all, and oxygen gas is only really important at the shortest wavelengths. So absorption of terrestrial radiation is dominated by triatomic molecules, specifically ozone, water vapor, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, plus methane, which is not really a triatomic molecule, but it plays into things nonetheless. And that is because these molecules have rotational and vibrational modes. And it turns out, in order to really be excited by infrared radiation, um, I mean, I personally get excited by infrared radiation just by learning about it, but for these molecules to be excited about infrared radiation, they need to have these rotational and vibrational modes.
Um, and so these modes are really only, or sorry, these gases are only really only present in tiny concentrations, but do play a key role in the absorption of terrestrial radiation, and they are key examples of greenhouse gases. We'll get into a bit that in a bit more in the next lecture as we talk about the chemistry of the Earth's atmosphere. All right. So we've considered scattering and absorption of incoming photons. Let's now turn our attention to reflection. So reflection can occur either in the atmosphere or when the photon impacts the land surface. However, the measure of how much energy is actually reflected is in encapsulated in this concept known as albedo. By definition, albedo is the ratio of reflected solar energy to incident solar energy, and this can be represented either as a fraction or as a percent. Uh, on the right-hand side here, we see various land types and atmosphere types, um, including different cloud types, which are notorious for reflecting incoming solar radiation, um, and the corresponding albedo associated with those features. You'll notice in the atmosphere, some of the most reflective surfaces include the cumulus and stratus clouds. And um, on the land surface, we have fresh snow as a primary reflector. Consequently, the upper latitudes, um, so the polar regions, tend to be highly reflective of incoming energy, which means, of course, that in addition to not receiving much insulation, these regions also reflect a lot of the incoming energy, uh, and consequently there's very little absorption of total energy. In cloudy regions as well, we find that incoming solar energy tends to be reflected by the presence of these clouds. Um, but besides that, there are other regions that also have fairly high reflectivities, including uh, dry sand and desert regions. Um, here having reflectivities in kind of the high 20% to the mid 40% range. Um, and meadows and crops and um, savanna also tend to have fairly high reflectivities, um, basically around 20%. The lowest reflectors are water, wet soil, and forest. So notably, these are the surfaces that tend to absorb the most incoming radiation and consequently tend to be very dark surfaces. Now, this plays quite importantly into the notion of energy balance for the Earth system as well as how different land use modifications can impact that energy balance. Consider for a moment what happens if a forest is clear-cut and replaced with cropland. What is going to happen to energy reflected from that particular surface? I'll give you a moment to think about that. Well, we know that forests are dark surfaces, and so they tend to absorb a lot of energy. If that forest is then turned into cropland, it's going to become a more reflective surface. That means that less incoming energy is going to be absorbed by the surface and more is going to be reflected. So purely from a uh, land type perspective, turning forests into crops actually tends to cool the region because you end up getting less energy absorbed overall. Relating to the concepts of black bodies that we discussed earlier, which of these surface types is most closely associated with a black body? If you answered water or forest or wet soil, then you're correct. The darker the surface, the more it absorbs and the closer it is to being a perfect absorber like the idealized black body that we discussed earlier. Here's a map of mean annual cloud cover fraction over the globe. That is, for the duration of the year, approximately what percentage of the time do we have clouds above that particular location? You'll notice that the regions of the world that have the highest cloud cover fraction tend to be around the um, subpolar latitudes, particularly over the ocean, as well as over the equatorial uh, convergence zone. In the subpolar regions, we have quite a bit of moisture transport coming from the subtropics regions that then leads to condensation in the formation of clouds within these regions. Also, you'll notice high cloud cover fraction in the alpine regions. Where cloud cover fraction tends to be high, that's also where we tend to have high reflectivity or high atmospheric albedo, where you have a lot of energy reflected um, by the presence of these clouds. In the subtropics, so in the desert regions of the world, we have some of the lowest cloud covers, and so in these regions, incoming photons from the sun are able to make it through and reach the surface of the planet. The surface has different reflective characteristics as well, depending on the underlying surface type. 
Here we show the different biomes that are present uh, around the world, showing in kind of the northern latitudes, as expected, we have tundra and polar conditions, which are associated with relatively high reflectivities because of the presence of snow. In the uh, subtropics, we have higher reflectivities due to the presence of arid desert and other dry, uh, dusty, sandy conditions. And in the equatorial bands and the temperate bands, we have tropical forests and temperate forests, which tend to be uh, highly efficient absorbers of incoming radiation, and so tend not to reflect very much. Um, the white region of this plot is, of course, the oceans of the world, and there, much of the incoming radiation is absorbed by the oceans, leading to warming. The net reflectivity, then, can be calculated for these various surface types, um, and we can actually use satellite observations in order to estimate the global albedo of the whole planetary surface. Here, the polar regions are removed because they have such high reflectivities that they would basically saturate the color bar on this particular plot. Um, but you can see in the high latitudes we have high reflectivities, high albedos, and in the Sahara in particular we also have high reflectivities because of the dry, dusty, uh, sandy conditions found there. In the tropical regions we typically have fairly low albedos, but there is of course some noise depending on your specific location. Once you know the albedos of each individual location, you can of course assess the total planetary albedo. Um, it turns out that approximately 30% of the total incoming solar radiation is reflected by both the atmosphere and surface together. Now that's about 25% reflected by the atmosphere and about 5% reflected by the land surface. So if you remove this uh, basically 30% of the total incoming solar radiation from the calculation, you can then estimate the total amount of solar radiation that is actually absorbed by the Earth is approximately given by about 1.22 times 10 to the 17 watts. Here we're multiplying by a factor of 1 minus alpha p, that is the total amount of radiation that actually plays a role in energy balance of the system. This 1 minus alpha p term actually shows up quite often in our energy balance models because only the non-reflected radiation tends to play a role in energy balance. Formally, the planetary albedo is the fraction of incoming solar radiation at the Earth reflected back to space averaged over the whole planet, and if you go into planetary atmosphere studies, for instance, you'll be able to quantify the planetary albedo of the various planets throughout the solar system. Um, and this always plays a role then in assessing the energy balance of those planets. So once we uh, consider all the different pathways that energy can potentially move through in the atmosphere Earth system, you can produce a diagram that looks kind of like this. Here we have normalized 100 units of incoming solar radiation. Um, you can go back to our previous calculations about the actual amount of energy that is present and you can scale it accordingly if you so desire. But this normalization provides a nice clear way of seeing where the different energy pathways basically that energy experiences within the system. So uh, as I mentioned on the left hand side of this diagram, reflected radiation, it is associated with about 30 units that are sent immediately back to space, 25 units from reflection by the atmosphere, and 5 units reflected by the terrestrial surface. Of the remaining uh, 70 units, about 45 of those units are absorbed by the surface, and about 25 of those units are absorbed by the atmosphere. So this is effectively the fate of all the incoming solar radiation. Now recall the terrestrial radiation tends to be peaked in the infrared part of the spectrum and so it's handled somewhat separately. On the right hand side here we have 104 units of infrared radiation sent, to, sent up from the terrestrial surface uh, of which uh, 34 units are absorbed by the atmosphere and about 70 units then are emitted uh, total to space from both the terrestrial surface and the atmosphere. About 88 units are sent back down to the surface from the atmosphere through infrared radiation. Uh, since the atmosphere itself is can be approximated as a black body, it can also be assumed to be uh, emitting radiation both upwards and downwards, and so that's where this contribution from the atmosphere is coming from. The term that is associated with atmospheric radiation back down to the surface is a trapping of radiation and is also known as the greenhouse effect. <laughs>
This is because it emerges from greenhouse gases which are blocking terrestrial radiation from directly escaping to space. All right, so this simplified model of energy balance then provides us with enough fodder in order to really delve into the eventual fates of energy within the Earth system. We're now going to spend the remainder of this lecture investigating um, different ways in which we can build idealized models of this energy balance system in order to estimate surface temperature of the planet. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to quantify this emission temperature. So we talked earlier that in order for the Earth to be in energy balance with the energy absorbed from the sun, it needs to be emitting energy uh, in accordance with a black body that has a temperature of about 255 degrees Kelvin. Here's a compact formula that allows one to actually compute the emission temperature of the planet in terms of the planetary albedo, the solar constant, and the Stefan Boltzmann constant. If you plug in the known quantities for the Earth, you'll find that the emission temperature is, again, 255 degrees Kelvin. Um, yeah, again, taking the quantities shown here. However, the surface temperature of the planet is, of course, 288 degrees Kelvin, which is about 33 degrees higher than the emission temperature. Um, so if the Earth actually had no atmosphere, we would find that the surface temperature would be about 255 degrees Kelvin. So we're thankful to the greenhouse effect for providing relatively mild conditions at the surface. If it wasn't for the greenhouse effect and the trapping of radiation by greenhouse gases, we would actually have a much, much cooler and relatively inhospitable surface to deal with. So the, this effect, known as the greenhouse effect, um, basically refers to the trapping of terrestrial radiation by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, so namely blocking and re-emission of outgoing terrestrial radiation by the atmosphere. And formally, the gases that contribute to the greenhouse effect are then referred to as greenhouse gases. So the basic process here again is an outgoing terrestrial radiation photon from the Earth's surface is emitted upwards towards space. It is absorbed and re-emitted several times throughout the atmosphere and possibly then even returning to the surface. Note that the atmosphere will absorb basically uh, isotropically, that is, it, it, uh, sorry, it emits approximately isotropically, so it can emit both up to space and back down to the surface of the planet. So the first idealized approximation to the Earth's atmosphere we can come up with is this opaque one-layer atmosphere model. In this approximation, we assume we have um, two black bodies. We have a black body representing the surface and a black body representing the atmosphere. These black bodies are heated by solar radiation, which we assume can pass freely through the atmosphere without being attenuated. This is, of course, an approximation, but it is a relatively good approximation, and so one that we will stick with. The total solar input is equal to the solar constant divided by 4, and the amount of reflected solar radiation by the whole system is given by the planetary albedo times that incoming radiation amount. So the total amount of solar radiation that is then absorbed by the surface is 1 minus alpha p times s naught over 4. So from the terrestrial surface, we then have that the surface radiates energy upwards. Since we are assuming an opaque atmosphere, it absorbs all upgoing or upwelling radiation. The total amount of upwelling radiation is given by S up arrow, and the atmosphere then emits isotropically, that is the same amount of radiation upwards and downwards, um, some to space, some back to the surface, and that amount is given by a up arrow for emission to space and a down arrow for radiation to the surface. All right, so given these simple inputs, can we then calculate the surface temperature? So we have net solar flux per unit area. We have terrestrial emission to space. We have downwelling energy from the atmosphere, and we have um, the surface total energy balance. Recall the whole system, or both the surface and the atmosphere have to individually be in energy balance. And so this allows us to close the system of equations and solve for the total amount of surface upwelling radiation, which then allows us to solve for the surface temperature by using the uh, Stefan Boltzmann law. So plugging that in, 
what we find is that in this model with an opaque atmosphere, the surface temperature is actually going to be equal to the fourth root of two times the emission temperature. All right, this fourth root of two is approximately equal to 1.19. So let's take our emission temperature value of 255 Kelvin and multiply it through, and we get a surface temperature estimate of 303 Kelvin. So instead of underestimating surface temperature, now with our single layer opaque atmosphere, we are actually overestimating surface temperature. We're getting a little bit closer though. Notably before we were underestimating by about 33 Kelvin, now we're overestimating by about 15 Kelvin. So although this approximation is cl much closer to our expected value, it's now an overestimate. So why might it be the case that this is an overestimate? It turns out actually that this approximation of an opaque atmosphere is not necessarily true. Not all solar flux incident at the top of the atmosphere does reach the surface, which may be a second approximation, but more so, it's the opaque atmosphere that is probably the worst approximation here. So let's consider a second model. This is known as the one-layer leaky atmosphere model. We're going to assume that instead of absorbing all terrestrial radiation, instead the atmosphere only absorbs a fraction of the incoming terrestrial radiation. The fraction that it absorbs, then, is going to be given by this epsilon quantity. So we have to introduce an additional tuning parameter in order to, in, in order to build this second model of the system. In this case, the solar radiation is treated exactly the same. Uh, the, solar, uh, sorry, the terrestrial emission from the surface is, again, S up arrow, and the atmosphere radiation down to the surface is, again, treated like a black body. Again, this is A up arrow and A down arrow, and this is proportional to the atmospheric temperature. But now we have a certain amount of surface radiation that is able to escape to space equal to 1 minus epsilon times S up arrow. Note again that we ha must have energy balance within the system. Total surface radiation uh, mu must have energy received equals energy emitted. Atmospheric, uh, the atmospheric layer must have energy received equals energy emitted. And to space, we must have energy received equals energy emitted. So can we calculate the surface temperature in this modified scenario? The math itself uh, is, again, Requ well, requires a little bit of algebra, but it turns out that actually it's not too difficult, and I encourage you to go through the calculation in order to see what's going on. After some manipulation, what we get is that the surface temperature is then proportional again to the emission temperature, but now with a constant equal to 2 over 2 minus epsilon, all, uh, all of which to the 1 quarter power, or the fourth root. All right, so this means that we have tuning per, a tuning parameter again in order to figure out the surface temperature. But what does epsilon actually mean? So let's consider the limits as epsilon goes to 0 and epsilon goes to 1 and compare that with our previous models of the atmosphere. So if epsilon is equal to 0, basically what that means is that the atmosphere allows all radiation to pass through. So in this case, if we plug that into our new surface temperature formula, we get 2 over 2, and that is, of course, equal to 1. The fourth root of 1 is 1, and so the surface temperature is exactly equal to the emission temperature. So we find, in that case, that the leaky atmosphere model that lets all the energy through actually matches with our model with no atmosphere. This, of course, makes sense, because the atmosphere never plays a role, then, in the energy balance model. If we take the limit as epsilon goes to 1, in which case the atmosphere absorbs all of the terrestrial radiation, then our ratio inside the parentheses here is 2, and so we get back the model with the single layer opaque atmosphere. So this is, this of course makes sense again, because if epsilon equals 1, then the atmosphere is absorbing all of the incoming terrestrial radiation. So both limits make sense, but that means that the truth must lay somewhere in between. So other models can be considered as well. We can consider multiple layers of atmosphere, and you can solve for uh, different uh, emissivities or different leakiness levels through each of these layers. Um, these more complicated atmospheric models I leave as an exercise for the reader. But one might consider a extension in kind of the infinite 
uh, case of multiple atmospheric layers. Obviously, in reality, we have a continuum of atmospheric layers and not individual atmospheric layers within the system. There's no discrete atmospheric layers. So one can consider different emissivities, different uh, leakiness levels associated with each atmospheric layer and consider the limit then of an infinite number of atmospheric layers and then solve for this system as well. In this case we're gonna to have to rely on a computer in order to actually do the algebra for us as the by hand it would be quite nasty. But one can use real observations of water vapor, carbon dioxide, and ozone concentrations within the atmosphere in order to estimate the epsilon value for every atmospheric layer. And if one was to do this, one could actually produce a, uh, a vertical temperature profile that looks not entirely unreasonable. So here we see a decreasing temperature through the troposphere of the model, and then increasing temperature above that layer through the stratosphere. So this doesn't look too bad. However, there are some aspects associated with this that are unphysical and don't match with reality. In particular, we see a discontinuity in the temperature near the surface, where the temperature gets exceptionally large. In the real atmosphere, this does not actually exist. I'll leave it to you to think about why that might be the case for a moment. So even though this model does consider radiative exchange. It doesn't consider the other forms of energy transmission that we introduced earlier in this lecture. In particular, it does not include convection. In fact, if the surface temperature was as warm as it was in this radiatively balanced model, we would get rising air that, inst that spontaneously occurred in the near surface and that would rise through the troposphere leading to rising motion and convective transfer of energy. So the purely radiative model of the atmosphere is not a particularly good approximation. In order to get closer to reality, what we need to do is include convection, which would lead to what is known as radiative convective equilibrium. All right, let's turn our attention to another very important concept that arises naturally out of looking at these idealized models. These greenhouse models illustrate important radiative feedbacks that play a critical role in regulating the climate of the planet. But we have seen a number of parameters that pop up along the way, and it requires observations in order to constrain these possible parameter values. In the one-layer leaky atmosphere model, we have alpha p, which is the planetary albedo, we have s0, which is the solar constant, and we have epsilon, which represents the leakiness of the atmosphere. This epsilon quantity in particular is very interesting because it's connected to the chemical composition of the atmosphere. If we have more carbon dioxide in the system, then one would anticipate that the atmosphere tends to absorb more incoming solar radiation and hence tends more closely towards an opaque atmospheric model. So a key question that we want to answer as climate scientists is what is the sensitivity of the surface temperature to modifications of the atmospheric system? In particular, in these idealized models, we might be interested in assessing that sensitivity of surface temperature to changes in epsilon, or small changes in epsilon, that might be induced because of human activity. This notion is known as climate sensitivity, and it's the change in surface temperature that is induced by a change in some parameter q or more concisely represented mathematically as the partial derivative of the surface temperature with respect to Q times some change in that quantity Q. In the literature, or in common parlay about climate sensitivity, one is typically actually referring to carbon dioxide sensitivity. Uh, in the IPCC, for instance, one might find uh, climate sensitivity to refer to the change in surface temperature experienced associated with a doubling in atmospheric carbon dioxide from pre-industrial levels. This value is currently estimated at about 3 degrees Celsius plus or minus 1.5 degrees Celsius, and this value has actually remained fairly stubbornly, um, with the same error bars, fairly stubbornly for about the past 30 years. So our estimates of it are slowly improving, but we, but can pretty much emerge naturally from the idealized models that we studied in this previous chapter. So I encourage you to read a little bit more about 
climate sensitivity and some of the issues that are associated with these particular estimates. I'll give you a hint though that the climate the interconnectedness of the climate system plays a big role in affecting our uncertainty associated with this climate sensitivity. You can imagine that the different responses of the Earth system to warming can very easily produce feedbacks that are then responsible for inherently modifying the sensitivity of the system. These climate feedbacks can be either positive climate feedbacks or negative climate feedbacks. In this image, actually, we see examples of both positive climate feedbacks and negative climate feedbacks. A common example being, as we warm the near surface, this warming causes more evaporation and more water vapor in the atmosphere then traps more heat. However, we also have the tendency to have more clouds that are present because of more water vapor in the atmosphere. And this can cause both positive feedback and a negative feedback. On the positive feedback side, we have more water vapor causing more clouds, which then trap more heat. This means that as we have more clouds, we're having more, uh, temp more warm air trapped in the near surface. But as we saw earlier in our assessment of atmospheric albedo, we also find more clouds tend to reflect more sunlight. That is, they tend to reflect more incoming solar radiation. This then leads to less energy being present within the system that contributes to energy balance, and so we get a cooling of the near surface. Which feedback is more important? Well, that's a topic that we're still investigating, and one that is addressed with every IPCC assessment report. The interconnectedness that is present within the system is again captured within this Bretherton diagram, and understanding these connections and the magnitude of these connections remains a topic of ongoing research for climate scientists worldwide. All right, thank you very much for sitting through this long lecture on energy in the Earth system. I hope you've learned a little bit about the different energy feedbacks within the system and what happens to energy. In our next lecture, we're going to be extending on this further and investigating vertical structure of the atmosphere and then going into how convection plays a role in modifying the movements of energy and moisture within the system.